Buenos días, bienvenidos a este encuentro de bibliotecas y municipio. En primer lugar, queremos disculparnos porque, como habéis visto, hemos tenido un problema informático en el sistema de inscripciones. Eh, quiero presentar a la ponente inaugural, Ilona Kish. Ilona Kish es la directora del programa de bibliotecas públicas 2020 de la Reading and Writing Foundation. Eh, que es una fundación que está en Holanda, su oficina está en Bruselas y allí, entre otras cosas, se dedica a planificar la planificación estratégica de, de este programa. Anteriormente eh, dirigió también Culture Action Europe, que es una asociación paraguas eh, que agrupa a diversas asociaciones para la promoción, la promoción de las artes y la cultura en, en Europa. Cuando quieras. Muchas gracias. Uh, me encanta estar con vosotros. Uh, muchas gracias al Ministerio para invitarme. Lo siento, no voy a hablar en español para todo. Hablo un poco, pero uh, no voy a continuar en español. <risa> Espero que todo el mundo pueda ver bien um, la... Ok, that's fine, great. Ok, so, I'm really, really, really pleased to be here. Um, I've got quite a long speech, so I'm going to be telling you some of the things that we've been working on here in um, our program. And I hope we have a few minutes for some questions afterwards, if um, people need that. So, Public Libraries 2020, this is just a few of the things that we're working on. I really see my job and that of what we're doing is to make sure that European libraries will survive and even thrive in the future. I'm an advocate for libraries and a campaigner for libraries that are well-valued and also well-funded. And I think we're coming to a kind of tipping point right now, that there is a kind of movement that's growing across Europe that's going to reinvigorate all of our libraries. And I know that that's going to involve all of you to be advocates for what you do and also perhaps to change a little bit of what you do and how you do it. I want to talk to you today about some of the conversations I've been having with policymakers and librarians across Europe And I hope it will be useful for you to hear some of the stuff that's happening somewhere else. But mostly I want to talk about the future, because I'm convinced that we have a fantastic future in front of us, as we've had a fantastic past. So when I was preparing this speech, I had some help um, from a rather strange source, an alt-right British journalist, a man who usually writes articles supporting President Trump and Brexit. But maybe he got bored of that because uh, a few weeks ago, literally, maybe two or three weeks ago, he decided to post this tweet. Three days after he posted this tweet, 110,000 people had replied. And I'm going to share some of those replies with you. But when I first saw this, I thought, what would my response be? to Mr. Walker. I say 100 million people go to over 65,000 libraries every year. There are 4 million Europeans or more who are going online for the first time. And how does that look in Spain? These are fact sheets that we've been producing for the last few years, um, one that we produced for Spain It seems that over a million adults use a computer in a library, checked out 60 million books, 8.6 million visitors. It, numbers are huge for Spain. And I know from data that the ministry shared with me when I was preparing for this that user of libraries is growing every year in Spain, which is not the case in every country. Spain's looking pretty good. What about the rest of the world? I would want to show my friend, Mr. Walker, this slide. Because I bet if I asked him, and if I asked many other people as well, they would say, Europe, you know, it's full of these crumbling old libraries. The only sound you can hear is an old librarian saying, shh. We know that we don't have a lot of statistics in our sector, and it's really important that we get better at counting our statistics. So I'm so pleased that IFLA's launched this world map this year. We need to compile a better evidence base on what we're doing. But what we know, of course, is that visitor numbers or library loans, book loans, is the smallest part of the story. The question is, what are people doing in libraries today? This is some data from a study that the Gates Foundation did a few years ago. 
A lot of Europeans using library resources to find jobs and learn new skills. But I didn't need to reply to Mr. Walker's tweet because 110,000 people did. I don't know if you can see some of these quotes. Here is some of the reason that the Twitter users are going to their libraries. And there's a lot more, but I wanted to start up with the issue that comes up quite a lot in this field, which is around the question of digital skills and digital engagement. Um, and also around building community, which is what I want to come to. I don't know if any of you have ever seen this. It's uh, part of a presentation that the director of Aarhus Doc One Library Citizen Service, Mr. Rolf Harpel, if any of you have had the pleasure to meet him, he's a dynamic director, and this library is a real uh, standard setter. This is a theory developed in the 1960s, um, but it's a key pillar of the philosophy of citizen services and engagement that the Doc Library has developed, really seeing the way in which the library can become a central role in building democratic participation from its citizens, moving up a ladder from where we're just being consulted or used as token representatives up to something where citizens are really, really paying a vibrant part in their communities. And the libraries and the way that DOC is working with that in Aarhus is central to that, and I think it's a really interesting model. These different disruptive models or ideas of new libraries are also definitely motors for um, new investment, and I've seen a lot of evidence for that in Spain. Um, when I was researching this speech, I had a lot of fun um, going to a leading architecture website, Art Daily. I was looking. New libraries in Spain is what I looked for. Did you know, according to this data source, in the last 10 years, there were more than 350 libraries built worldwide that were major architectural projects. 176, more than half of them built in the EU. And in this website, they counted 34 new libraries in Spain, which was the third biggest in the world after the US and France followed by, I think, Canada and China. And these were just the ones that were picked as projects of note. Their new libraries, many of them were libraries and shared spaces, community spaces, cultural centres. Um, I just picked ones that I thought were beautiful, that were interesting, that inspired me. But they're definitely talking about a sense of space and community. And a lot of the stuff behind that is a digital investment as well. When we talk about digital investment, um, it's at the top of my agenda when I'm talking to European policy, policy makers, and it's something that inspires at the same time fear and also a sense of opportunity. So are we afraid of what's coming in digital? Do we know how to do it? Or is it the future? And we need to embrace it positively. I'm going to say it's positive and the way to look forward. And I want to say why it's important in the European context and for the European conversations that I'm having. When we started um, in this project, we were looking at um, things that were interesting for EU policymakers, education and skills, copyright, social inclusion, digital inclusion, lifelong learning. And this quote for me is extremely important in terms of the potential and the space that libraries will fill when it comes to European policy making. Because um, the numbers of EU citizens who lack even basic digital skills is very, 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 very high. And their assumption is that in the short term, that skills gap will get even bigger as increasing numbers of jobs, and not just technology jobs, but regular jobs will require increasing numbers of digital skills. And that's why the European Commission has made digital information a priority and why I think that there's an opportunity for libraries in this disruptive, new, modern model of libraries to take some space. I'm sure that you have some ideas about how this is happening in Spain and what policymakers are doing in Spain to address this challenge. Um, but in many countries, as at EU level, the problem is uh, with fractured policy making, this activity spreads across lots of different ministries and it's difficult to know where the policy change is going to come from, 
and where the investment's going to come from. And it's one of the reasons why we've decided to do a great deal of work in this area and putting libraries into the heart of citizens and digital policy because although it feels like the future, it feels like it's also now and I think it's one of the single biggest areas of opportunity and growth where libraries actually have a unique offer and a unique contribution to make. I want to tell you about one very small initiative that we've been working on a lot at EU level and I'm taking time to spend a few moments on it now um, because this was a flagship program of the European Union for this year. And it's a program that's focused on bringing high-speed Wi-Fi and internet into regions and municipalities. What's interesting about this scheme is that municipalities and libraries will be able to apply directly for small amounts of funding to improve their digital and Wi-Fi service to their customers. Maybe 15, 20,000 euros per grant. Um, this is one of the first times that the EU has developed a scheme with direct small amounts of money that are available to local actors. And what I would say is that um, it's an example of where new funding might be coming from in the future. And that for you today, it's an opportunity to take something to your local authorities, to your ayuntamientos, and tell them that this funding opportunity is here. It can be used to upgrade, improve, or even install Wi-Fi where it doesn't exist. And the role that we played was to lobby to make sure that public libraries were explicitly included in this call and recognized as public spaces. So it's a small initiative. It's an interesting initiative. But if libraries can use this as a way to show how they're connecting to their citizens and how they're helping citizens bridge their digital gaps, it's also a way where libraries and municipalities can have additional new funding from new sources. This is a rather complex infographic produced by the Commission, but I wanted to just spend a moment on it because it speaks to three areas where I think libraries also have a lot to say. If we start on the right with the older generation, I know that we as librarians are really familiar with this age group. Libraries are a critical resource um, for the older generation who might not have these skills, might be afraid of what the digital age brings, may not have equipment at home. Um, librarians are already helping them to carry out simple activities online, and we know that this is going to be even more important as more and more essential services are going online in the future. Working age people are also struggling to keep up with new technologies. Um, EU and Commission spending a lot of time on looking at schemes and strategies to help people who are in employment and of course young people because they're the greatest challenge of all. Um, huge majority of the young population live online and the challenge here is that the people who have to help them and teach them know less than you and I think that's especially through of libraries sometimes. Um, the challenge of that is, quote, is summed up by this quote that um, is one of my favourites when I'm thinking about the digital era. Douglas Adams, author of The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, who's an inspirational doctor of early technology. And when I think of myself, I think, you know, we don't think about how wooden floor is made or how this glass was made, because I take that for granted. I thought that the invention of the mobile phone was revolutionary. And the fact that I call it a mobile phone says something. I find Snapchat incomprehensible and self-driving cars, frankly, terrifying. Um, I think it's a great quote because it describes the challenge facing our community with a big proportion of library staff who are often well over the age of 35. And it's a way in which the, our profession is challenged to change now. I'm sure we can remember life before technology and we know that there are other generations that are challenged to run and you know, keep up with the new technologies. Um, but when we're thinking about digital and we're thinking about these basic infrastructures, these have gone from being new to being essential and a, and a given. You, know, you, you cannot have a library that doesn't offer a printer, a Wi-Fi, internet access, something like that. Is it enough? You know, I think there's a generation now who are practically born with smartphones in their hands. The question for me is, what could we do for them? What's their new exciting technology? And how can libraries 
be the space in which they discover some of that new technology and learn to use it properly. It's a generation that vote with their feet. Uh, sometimes we talk about what is a competition um, that libraries might be facing. You know, and the li libraries are facing competition in a device that looks like this. Um, and they'll go somewhere else if they can't get what they want in their local libraries. There's another picture of a new library. This is a, uh, oops, is that right? Yeah, De Krog in Belgium, opened this year. It's gone from 2,000 visitors a day in the old central library to around 7,000 visitors a day. There's a fierce competition for spaces, especially from students. And obviously, it's a new capital investment. It's a big building. Um, but it's not, it's not really just about the money. It's about the way they've thought about the services that they're offering in the, um, in the library. And it's done some really amazing work at looking at how they can work with and develop the community. Um, and it's really not just about the fun and games that you see here, but about skills. Um, and facing the skills crisis that Europe is definitely facing. It's true for the continent, certainly. And I think it's true for our librarians as well. Um, and I think that if we can engage with the digital challenges, um, it can be a gateway for us to survive and thrive and generate and reach different audiences in different ways. I think it's an important step for us to take. All of this thinking and all of the conversations that we've had with the European Commission over the last few years, we keep on hearing digital skills, development, thinking, what, what are we doing in libraries today and what can we do and how can we show them? And that was the reason that we organised this exhibition of Generation Code. It was the second year this year. High-level speakers, trending on Twitter. Um, the idea was to invite libraries from across Europe to showcase what they were doing in digital areas. 3D printers, robots, some stuff that I'm sure many of you have seen. I can tell you that the 100 members of European Parliament who visited it, most of them had never seen a 3D printer. Most of them had never interacted with some sort of interactive teaching robot, which are increasingly present in modern libraries. Um, we did a coding class um, with Sphera robots and teenage girls. You know, for the members of the European Parliament to see this and to understand that this is something that's happening in a local library was really, really transformational. I just think it's key that we start to explore this further, that we show policymakers what we're doing. Um, because the future is going to have a strong digital element and it's coming now. And also because those people like my dear Mr. Walker who claim that the libraries are empty often like to add that um, libraries aren't needed because we have Google now. And um, I don't know if many of you have heard this, but certainly I've had this said to me several times by politicians and MEPs and I have to think about what my answer is. And at the beginning I would say, Google gives you thousands of answers, the librarian gives you the right one, and you know, these answers that we like. But now, I, you know, I feel that this kind of battle against the internet and that you can't love books and love new technology, that books, libraries, that image of the past, it's gonna fail because somehow that's something in the old times, which I hear a huge amount. Um, Obviously, what I come back from is to say that this is an information-rich world, that we need curators of that information even more. And that's what libraries have always done and librarians have already done. But it doesn't mean that librarians or libraries are threatened by this digital revolution because it's not librarians versus digital. We need both and we need them to be able to work together. So I jumped on this article from the Wall Street Journal. This was maybe two or three days ago, and I see articles like this all the time on Twitter. So the article says uh, we need librarians more than ever, but when you read the article, what does it say? The, li the, the user comes into the library, and the librarian looks something up on the internet for him. You know, 
And, and it's sooner or later that user will know how to use the internet themselves. So the offer and the transformation has to change. It's not about librarians looking up stuff on the internet. It's about understanding what's on the internet. And it's also about reflecting the community. So I referenced earlier um, this idea about community building. And for me, this is at the heart of digital expansion. It's the heart of modern library development. And it's the heart of innovation. And in general, it's what we see with these exciting new builds. There are definitely some paradoxes in there, um, in these new modern libraries. Um, Europeans definitely value libraries. There's no question about that. Um, we don't have a lot of perception studies in Europe of how libraries are viewed. I don't know if some of you have seen the Pew Research Center in the US. They do a great deal of um, research into um, library usage. And the biggest statistic tends to be 80 90% think the library is a good thing and they value it. But 40 50% go. You know, there's always a big gap between I think the library's great and I love it and I want it to be there, but I don't necessarily go myself. And that's the challenge there. You know, um, there's a respect for libraries. They're places that are dedicated for learning. They're often historical and cultural. Um, so there's a paradox between the cultural preservation, the exciting new builds um, that you see, um, you know, like in Girona, um, but systemic cuts at local level and small public libraries. Because sometimes libraries in Europe look like this. Um, this is a library in a town around 50 miles north of London. It's not, you know, Salamanca or Aarhus. It's not glamorous. It's not part of our wonderful heritage. And it's very vulnerable. Because maybe that's what Mr. Walker was thinking about when he sent that tweet. I've seen these libraries, nobody goes, no books, and no people. But there's definitely a story behind this picture. Um, the shelves are empty, because when it was announced in 2010 that the library was going to close, the community mounted a protest, and they took out the maximum number of books that they were allowed to. They cleared all 16,000 volumes from the shelves. It was about 378 books per hour I have here. So they each went with their library cards and checked out all the books. And they reconstituted the library in another building. So it's still going. Its future remains uncertain. But it's just a small example of how a small civic library inspires such love in its uh, community. And it's not the citizens of Stony Stratford alone. Here are some of the other Twitter responses to Mr. Walker, who talked about communities. The best libraries are definitely the intensely local ones. This is one of the paradoxes of the librarian's jobs. I don't know if anybody recognizes this is a wonderful library in Portugal, in Evora. On the one hand, we have to be guardians of these wonderful temples of learning, this nostalgia that people have for their libraries, a quiet place for contemplation, palace of learning. But we know and we hope that they've changed hugely since we were children. Um, libraries are noisier, you've got kids on PCs, helping people fill out stuff online, sharing tips on looking for work, musical recitals, language lessons. We were just talking in the break there saying, for me now, the question is not this cannot happen in a library, but why can't it happen in a library? What cannot happen in a library today? I feel like the library's been unshushed and unsilenced in some way. And it's not like there's one model of what your library needs or what your community needs. It could be a 3D printer, Game of Thrones DVDs, maker spaces. You know, the skill of the librarian is knowing what the local community needs. But there can definitely be a shock, some of these modern libraries, um, for people who haven't been in libraries since they were children. And certainly maybe that's the case for many of our elected politicians. And they may have this memory of their childhood library, and they want to see people quietly reading. Um, and they want libraries to stay as they were 20 or 30 years ago. 
Um, so the question is, can we have a realistic view of today's library and still keep that nostalgia of the libraries from the past and those beautiful spaces as well? So I think this nostalgic message, it can be an asset for the advocacy that we need to do, but we need to find a balanced message for the people who have these amazing memories from their childhood, but also to reassure them that the transformations that are really needed in society isn't stopping them from enjoying those more traditional functions in the library. Which brings me to something that's still at the heart of libraries. We've talked a little bit about these other spaces um, that you can find in libraries today, but for me, literacy and reading is still at the heart of what libraries are doing. Um, and I began by talking about digital because I feel it's current and I feel it's now. But literacy and reading is still something that's extremely central to what we're doing. It's most of what libraries are doing. According to the survey, 59% of internet users across the world read a book at least once a month, which is pretty high. 30% um, read, read most days. And um, when I looked at which country had the most daily readers was China, followed by the UK and Spain. So apparently, according to this survey, 32% of Britons and Spaniards read every day, which is a remarkably encouraging statistic. Which was what people said to my dear Mr. Walker last night. This Twitter thread was really, really long. Um, so people saying people read books, libraries build communities, libraries get digital skills. What did he do? After a few days of tweeting and tweeting and tweeting, defending the library, his views cracks started to come out. First he was nervous saying that, okay, libraries might be fine for others, but they weren't for him. Then he said he might pop into his local library to have a quick look. And then he finally gave up. You should definitely have a look at this tweet. It's extremely entertaining. And it's kind of like a long list of advocacy arguments for why libraries are really great. Um, and it reminds us that people like this journalist might start off thinking that libraries are places for books, but they're places for communities and for reading and for people. So, thinking about this tweet thread got me thinking about a second paradox for me, which was, you know, an, un an unattractive journalist puts an aggressive and provocative tweet up. Hundreds of thousands of people, no, libraries are great, fantastic, wonderful. Hundreds of millions of librarians visit every year. So what's, what's the problem? Is everything great? Um, why are we so many librarians struggling for funding, struggling to attract new audiences? Spain is unusual in seeing increasing user figures every year. Many countries in Europe are seeing the opposite. I'm sad to have to cite the UK as an example and again. Um, when I was asking about what's happening in Spain, I understood that there haven't been so many library closures, but certainly cutting in hours, cutting in staff times, not to mention restrictions on staff funding and uh, budgets for collections and other activities. Um, so there seems to be a paradox for me with, between this love that we have of libraries and that we feel of libraries and the investment and support that libraries are getting. Um, you know, and obviously some data that we collect can help that, but the question is really about how we're talking about our libraries and the messages that we're giving it's what we're doing in the libraries and how we're talking about them. Advocacy. And I visit hundreds of libraries every year, and I know that seeing a great library is the best advocacy of all. Talking about a library is fantastic. Seeing a library for yourself is the best advocacy of all. And that's why we started a program a few years ago to show politicians and elected officials what's happening in their local libraries, show them how libraries are vectors of social justice, how they're places that you see democracy and participation in action, and that they're an underutilized resource in policy making. 
We started with 15 countries in Europe bringing members of the European Parliament in to see the libraries. Can you imagine there's me in Brussels in the European Parliament. I'm going to go and visit a member of the Parliament in their office and I'll say, you know what, there's this really great library in Girona. You should see it. It's not the same as getting that person in to see for themselves. We made super short videos of the visits talking about what's happening in the libraries, getting the politicians to talk about what's happening. They're all online um, at this address. You can find them. And the impact was massive. Um, we had the then um, president of the European Parliament, uh, Mr. Schultz, in one of the first visits, who would turn to me and say, I haven't been in a library for over 10 years. I had no idea what was happening in libraries today. And you don't have to be a big central library either to have an impact. It's one of my favorite libraries and a great example of using social media for advocacy. There's Orkney, right at the top, edge of the EU, at least for the moment. It's a small remote island with 20,000 residents. And yet, um, with wit, charm, determination, they managed to create this dedicated fan base. I think they have, to date, 12,000 Twitter followers, more than the population of the town in which they live. Um, it's amazing what they're doing with the remote rural community, online advocacy. And they started an online rivalry with the library in the neighboring Shetland Islands, also tiny, and got a visit from this writer eventually. Social media is easy. You know, libraries can quickly set up accounts to communicate with the community, which I don't know if it's the case here in Spain as well. Certainly in many countries in Europe, um, Libraries have to off host their websites on the local government website, and that's often quite challenging to make an attractive, dynamic, and interactive website within a local government space. So a lot of the libraries that I know are doing really well using Twitter as a way to get around that, or Facebook to get around that, to help people know what they're doing. It's another fantastic example of advocacy that I found just uh, yeah, last month. The Manchester Public Library um, have a blog which their local town councillor sends out to all 96 members of parliament and councillors in the region. So the library is writing the blog, but he's the one that's sending it out and talking about it and promoting it to his colleagues in the greater Manchester area. Am I running too long? No, you're okay. Um, so... I think that bringing people into libraries, meeting with MEPs, this is what we did with our Generation Code, showing them the way that libraries are changing. Generation Code this year was a few uh, weeks ago. We had um, representatives from all EU countries, and um, the ask was to ask all of the representatives from the libraries to come and set up meetings with their members of European Parliament and show them something different about what's happening with them. Um, the libraries in their country and I was just looking we just got the data in a few days ago and I just wanted to say that the country that did the best was Spain um, who met you can't see there but I think met 14 or 15 members of the European Parliament was way more than any other people there so you have I'm not going to name names but you have two really kick-ass advocates for um, libraries at European level who were in Brussels with us a few weeks ago so I'm going to finish um, with a short video. I don't know if this works. No. It doesn't matter. Do you want... I'll either have to go out. Yeah. It doesn't work. The video is no good. Well, look, if it's not set up, it doesn't matter. We'll just have to leave it. That's okay. <coughs> Okay, I'm sorry, I had a short video to show you. It's not going to work. Um, just to finish, we were just talking with Adela earlier. This is one of our favorite quotes from David Lankes, who's an uh, esteemed librarian and um, US academic. I think he's one of the most visionary 
uh, librarians that we're working with today. I'm going to finish with that. Thank you very much for your time. I think the next five years have a lot of opportunities to offer us at national and at European level. And I'm happy to take some questions if there are any. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Ilona. Hola, buenos días. No. Eh, buenos días, muchas sí. gracias por la conferencia, muy interesante. Una pregunta así, muy breve. ¿Está en marcha ya, se puede pedir desde las bibliotecas municipales, desde cualquier biblioteca municipal, las ayudas para mejorar la conexión, el wifi? El wifi? Sí, sí, sí. sí. Ya no, está. todavía no, normalmente por el fin del año. Y se hace en dos fases. La primera fase es sol, solamente es el ayuntamiento, el municipalidad, que pueden preguntar. Y en el segundo fase sería la biblioteca misma que podría preguntar. Pero yo me digo que en primer lugar, qué bien que la biblioteca va a su ayuntamiento para decirlo. ¿Sabes? Ahí existe eso. Y qué bien que pueden preguntarle. Claro que a lo mejor sería un poco de competición entre las bibliotecas hay otras cosas en, las, en, el, en el región o en la municipalidad. ¿Me entiendes? ¿Hablo bien? Sí. Pero ¿por, por qué no ser la, la persona que, que sabe lo que pasa a nivel europeo? Y serían, yo creo, entre 15.000 y 20.000 euros y se puede utilizar para a mejorar o en primer lugar, si no hay también, porque a veces hay wifi, pero es muy, muy, muy uh, mal. En mi, en mi hotel aquí, el wifi es peor que el 4G. Y me cuesta el 4G. Uh. O sea que también se puede pedir para mejorar la wifi que tenemos instaladas. Sí, los dos. Yo creo que los dos, porque y, y no eres la primera, porque hay, hay muchas bibliotecas que tienen ya o no wifi, pero hemos empujado por eso también. ¿no? Porque la, la comisión quiere, lo que falta con la comisión es contactar con las um, personas, no saben hacerlo. Y lo que estamos diciendo a la comisión europea ¿no? es que en las bibliotecas pasan todos y pasan los que necesitan lo más. Y sobre todo cuando hablamos, hablamos de skills, no sé, com, com, competencias, en las bibliotecas son las competencias de muy bajos. Es, es allí que podemos agir. Entonces estamos pensando, por ejemplo, en un sistema de... Um, ¿Conocen Europe Direct? ¿Sí? Un sistema... ¿Por qué no un sistema igual que está financiado por el uh, Unión Europea? ¿no? para enseñar las um, competencias de vaso en, en el mundo digital en las bibliotecas. Así que pueden pasar un punto en la biblioteca a donde sabes preguntar ayuda con Skype, con algo, y que se, que se conta. En esta biblioteca hemos ayudado tantas personas en un año a cambiar, a mejorar sus competencias. Es perfecto por las bibliotecas. Mira ahí la, la, el señor ahí. Buenos días. ¿Se, ¿se oye? Sí. ¿Sí? sí. Bueno, gracias por la conferencia. Yo vengo de las bibliotecas del Ayuntamiento de Madrid. Eh, he trabajado durante unos años en el grupo web y de redes sociales de las bibliotecas públicas del Ayuntamiento. Y lo que sí quería decir, sobre todo, eh, que has hecho un pequeño hincapié en tener un espacio individual en Internet, en redes sociales. Eh, yo lo que sí quiero transmitir es que hay que tener un poquito de paciencia, ¿no? eh, porque nosotros desde el Ayuntamiento ya tenemos un espacio individual, también lo tienen las bibliotecas de la Comunidad de Madrid, y lleva mucho trabajo por parte de, de los bibliotecarios, trabajo extra, fuera del trabajo diario de mostrador, pero sí que es cierto, hombre, yo hablo desde un ayuntamiento que es el de Madrid, más grande, 
pero creo que merece la pena que los bibliotecarios, que hablamos mucho de las competencias digitales de cara a los usuarios, pero también nosotros tenemos que potenciar como bibliotecarios esas competencias ¿eh? y que yo desde luego pienso que desde los municipios hay, y parte de nosotros el esfuerzo, tenemos que empujar mucho para tener también esa presencia, ese espacio individual en internet, esa presencia en las redes sociales y es un trabajo desde luego duro, pero que yo en este encuentro animo a todos los trabajadores de municipios más pequeños o más grandes, uh -huh. luego también con quien te enfrentes, ¿eh? también por arriba, está claro. Pero que es un esfuerzo que a nosotros nos ha costado y creo que merece, merece la pena. Solamente quería uh -huh. anotar eso. ¿Y para vosotros vale la pena? Bueno, hay veces que la respuesta no es la, no es la que esperas por parte de los usuarios, pero yo creo que uh -huh. es un mundo un poco nuevo también para nosotros y hay que ir encontrando la estrategia o las líneas de acción para atraer por esa vía también a los usuarios. Sí, 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 un poco. Sí, sí. Es una pequeña reflexión. Yo, yo me digo que es, por en muchas partes estamos al principio de, de este, este cosa, ¿no? Y, y hay, que, hay que hacer para que el ayuntamiento y algo entiendan lo que es el valor de esto. Y que encontrar nuevo dinero también por eso, que no sale del Ministerio de la Cultura, pero Ministerio de, de, qué, de Empleja, de Social, de otras cosas para, para la integración social, porque el digital hace parte de eso. Entonces, pero es cambiar mucho el, la función de la biblioteca también. Mm. Mm. Muchas gracias. Bueno, pues muchas gracias. Gracias, Ilona. Gracias a todos. Gracias por a vosotros. Preguntas.